All right, so in this final video this week, I kind of want to reflect and go back. Um, it's so hard to make these videos um, in advance because I like to add things I hear from you each week or what I learn from your submissions each week, which is why I kind of delayed finishing this fourth video. And uh, I know a lot of you, um, you like miss a little step and things don't go right, but just be calm. I mean, we've got the Thursday night uh, help sessions and we have the Sunday morning help sessions. So hopefully, you know, working to prepare for those, I can answer your questions and we can move on. So I want to start from the very beginning. And that is that this course was built to provide the foundational knowledge and concepts we'd need in order to do this type of analysis. That traditionally, you know, in, in you know, a work comp data set or a loss run report, that's the same thing, um, or OSHA log data, you know, we do some calculations and we try to compare to something else. We say, oh, our safety program is either working or it's not because we're higher or lower than our comparison. And what I've tried to prove to you, I hope I have at least with some of you, that it's better just to monitor your own program within over a period of time. That the methods you're using to evaluate the workplace, the um, the problem solving techniques you're adopting, you know, whether you're involving the workers, you know, whether you're, you know, attempting to try to understand it from their perspective or take a uh, a quality management approach, a root cause analysis approach. You know, if you're not trying to really find out what's going on and avoid blaming the worker. Um, that you can come up with solutions that actually allow the worker to get their job done effectively, safely, and elicit satisfaction, and that you're involving supervisors, and that these solutions should be a sustainable improvement. You know, that over time you see an improvement in the safety, you see an improvement in productivity, you see an improvement, right? Uh, and we can't see that when we compare it to somebody else because they're in a completely different situation. Similarly, the basic assumption for this assignment and being able to forecast losses, we're assuming that the work system itself has not been affected by one, our evaluation and or two, the solutions we're trying to implement. So that the systems deficiencies, the work system deficiencies, and I remember we talked about this, we talked about it, you know, way back here in week two and week three, they are allowing workers to still be exposed to um, things that allow them to get injured and, and the resultant are work comp claims in this case. We're using comp data. There may be other forms of data out there that might be better, like near miss reporting or behavioral based safety observations or employee reports. Maybe better, but we, we this is the data set in which we've been given, so that's what we're doing the analysis on. I just had a student email me the other day and say, hey, um, I've got a bunch of near miss data. Um, what do you think I should do with it? And I said, use the technique I taught you in 43. You know, as you accumulate the frequency of either observations or claims or cases, whatever it might be, as long as there is information about that observation or claim, it can be sorted and understood over time of where you should focus. You know, what where what area, what task, what department needs more in-depth study? We need to have a discussion or ask questions we haven't asked before. I hope that makes sense. All right, the next thing I want to do is go back to the original assignment. You know, sometimes when you get a little bit lost in the weeds, you got to go back to, you know, your original position. Remember, you were given this data set and asked by management to analyze it in order to evaluate the quality of the data set. Sorry about my voice, too. I've got COVID. <laughs> um, assess the performance of the safety program or attempt to and make recommendations you know, where and what to focus on and forecasted losses. So that that's what, that's what you're asked to do. The concept is, um, how's the program performing? And, you know, where do you recommend we focus to get the most value? Yeah, that's what we're doing. And so that is sort of the genesis for this project, something simple like that. Uh, some of you were kind of not understanding the process we're going through. And this is the help document or the assistance document. And you can go tab to tab and look ahead to see what's coming next. So we just completed completed the cause. We're not gonna do the new cause cipher because we don't need it because this particular data set gave us a, a set of new causes, not causes, but parent causes. They give us 18, sometimes I work with 11. This is fine, it's fine what it is, we'll go with it. The next step is this one. This is what we're gonna be doing in next week. 
which I believe is week 11 of the semester, week three of the project, I think. And we're gonna be filling these tables. Uh, we're gonna be forecasting estimated future losses for a, we'll, we'll start with uh, the where. So we'll explore the class code, I'll explore location, I'll explore jurisdiction. That way you don't have to do all that work. You can see what I recommend you follow. Um, I'm excited to do that. It, there's a lot of repetition to it, but once you get it done, it goes pretty quick. And as you can see, I've got count, total, paid, and average, and I'm estimating future losses. See, this was to 2020. We're going to estimate to 2023 and just see what it is. Because when, when you break it down by variables such as class code, cause, things like that, you, you things will tease out of the, the generalness of it, the general tendencies, which we already kind of already know as we are trying to determine... Uh, overall, what are our priorities and how's the program performing? So that's what we're going to do. Beyond that, we're actually going to look at the causal agents, the primary cause of injury, whether it's one or two or three. Again, the Pareto ratio, risk, you know, the risk priority number and the Pareto ratio will tell us where the cutoff point is, or we'll kind of determine it based on that. And we will forecast there that for, you know, in this job or at this site or in this department, this type of injury appears to be going up or getting more costly or whatever it is. And we're going to explore those and extend them. And then we're going to complete um, this little table here. Oh, oh, I shouldn't have done that. This little table here. And then the, the last thing we're going to do is this is our final results. We're going to copy and paste these tables and then en manually enter them into this final table here. We've got the location, this will either be policy, class code, class code, location number, or jurisdiction. The cause code will be cause code because it gave it to us. There's no adjustments there. Uh, the range of claims, the number of estimated claims for 2023, that's, that's what we get out of this table here. Because we're going to look at it both from a uh, graphic perspective, so scatter plot forecast, and then, oh, sorry, this is a scatter, pop, scatter plot forecast. Uh, got COVID brain. And then the table is annual averages for the years that can be averaged. Um, so we fill this out and it gets all the way to the point where we determine what is the estimated total claims paid. And this is a conservative number. We want it to be conservative. You know, if we there, if, if, if most of the claims were like 5,000 and then we had like one $300,000 claim, all of a sudden the average would be like 65,000. We don't throw that in there because in asking for money to be invested, we can't really give them a reliable return on investment if if there's one once every 10 year expensive claim. We'll never be able to give them that return on investment. So therefore we go conservative by removing the outliers. That's why we do it that way. We come up with a conservative investment based on, we use, I usually use a 25% return on investment and that's in one year. Um, and when we get to that, I'll give you the equation for it. And then I report the outliers removed. So even though I'm giving them a conservative requested investment of thirty-four thousand, that does not include a claims that cost the company, you know, in this case right here, over four hundred thousand dollars. That is meant to be sort of my insurance policy. <laughs> insurance policy I'm requesting. That I've I've shown you the numbers. This is what I've come up with, which would be a safe investment of what we need to do. And by the way, I'm not including this big sum of money that's, that's there. Because I'm more reassured that you'll be able to give them a considerable return on that investment. Because it's not like you're going to eliminate everything, right? I mean, unless you, you're able to find like the magic bullet, the, you know, magic bean, the, well, I guess it's a silver bullet magic bean. I don't know what else, um, you know, rabbit out of the hat type of solution that completely eliminates it. Okay, then they're gone. And then you can rest assured that you could include this too, but we can't. Um, they're pro we're probably going to miss something. It's it's over time you kind of understand it and you work to the point where you, the best, you do the best you can. That's, that's realistic. In the real world, that's the way things work. And so going conservative with our estimates instead of crazy with the outliers in is the best way to go in my book. Um, just without getting too technical with statistics, I like that the best. So that's what we're working toward right now. And we're co we're currently right here. <laughs> so we're going to be doing these two next week. And then the final week is here. And this is this is where, you know, this is the big table. This is the one that you're going to have to customize uh, for your message that you're going to give management. Okay. 
for this week. Um, we finished here with the detailed causes with the outliers removed. Not a great, you know, end here. I mean, I think you probably detected it in my voice. You know, we got the equivalency of an 80% on the total claims paid for the top 14. That's, that's too many. When we get to it, you'll see that um, there needs to be a better cutoff. Um, that's too much, too much to look at. We like to narrow it down a little bit more. Uh, so what I did is I went back to my um, all cause without liars in and I, oh, I thought that I did this. So what I did is I thought, well, I wonder how my average cost per claims compares to the Wisconsin state claims. Even though they're all the indemnified ones, which makes ours a little bit lower because of that, uh, we could take out the $0 claims and find out what it is. But as we know from up above, it doesn't give us a big appreciable change, does it? Well, yeah, 39 to 57, maybe. Um, you know what? We could do that. Because all we have to do is copy this over and remove them. Um, so where do we get... Uh, so what I did is I did create an additional tab called the Average um, Comp... Uh, to DWD, and what I did is I copied that tab over, so my cause all, I brought it all the way over to here, and then what I did is I went up above, and I sorted by total paid, but low to high, and then I cut out all the zero dollar claims. Oh, I missed one. How did I miss one? How did I miss that? Huh. <gasps> Wait a minute. Something weird is happening. Why does it go to zero then after that? No, oh, it didn't. Okay. Just my, okay, this is down below. All right, I'm just going to stick this down here. Doesn't matter. It, it'll change it anyway. And then here are my numbers. And I'm going to show you how I got that other stuff. So I can now compare our average claim to what the state had listed on their DWD site. Um, let me zoom it in a little bit more, a little bit more. I get worried because it jumps around so much. And this is where you get it from, but I'm gonna show you anyway. And let's see, <clears throat> I gotta open up a web browser. Uh, I think it's, uh, is it dwd.gov? No. Uh, I'll type in Wisconsin. Is it Wisconsin? I really have. Uh, oh, I, I don't like. I don't like what what happened there. Wisconsin. Wow. I really. I need to take a nap, you guys. I pushed it to get this done. Okay, so it's dwd.wisconsin.gov. Man, I wanted to get this done today. If I nap, I'm done for the night. All right, so we. I, I gave you a tour of this before, but I'll give you another. You know how to find this data. So you go under workplace debt, workplace injury, under workplace safety, and I got, I need to, I, I'm, I'm going to interview the guy that runs all this. His name is Dave Lex. Just ran into him last Friday at the, at the meeting on campus. I'm going to do an interview with him. He'll talk about this stuff here. Scroll down now, and here we've got the BLS injury statistics, Wisconsin, state, Wisconsin, Wisconsin State Lab. Blah. And we've got the 2019 information. It actually goes all the way back to 2006, if you'd like. That stuff's old. I'll just click on the 2019 numbers. And in this report, so again, this is 2019 numbers. So they've probably come up, but they may not have because some of my reports say that Wisconsin has, has had a lower amount of claims over the last few years. <clears throat> okay. So these the, the highlighted, is that the right term? The bold, the bold, that are, those are the parent codes. The ones underneath them are the child codes. Just to compare, so our detail, or sorry, our regular cause are like the parent codes, and our detail cause are like the ones underneath it. So that's that's too detailed. Let's just go with these big ones. So what I did is I just highlighted it and pasted it on the other side of the table. 
So it's right here. So I've got holding and carrying. Now, yeah, I, you, it's hard to read, right? Because it's got the number, it's got the total, and it's got the average. But what I can do is I can compare that my average was just under 6,400. The state's average in 2019 was just under 8,000. My average is 10,500. Again, this was the $0 claims removed. So it's just when money was paid. Some are medical only, so that's dragging it down. I guess I could remove the medical only too. Do I dare? Oh, do I dare do that? Do I? Do I dare? Because that would be apples to apples. So that's total paid. That's medical. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. There's an indemnity. Got a lot of medical onlys. We don't have that many indemnities. Oh, we've got a few, I suppose. See, everything's here. It's just not many indemnified things. I'm not going to do it on this one, obviously, because I like where it is right now. But I, let's, let's just keep look going with what I was doing, and then I'll let my... What's the proper term? Neurosis? OCD? Whatever. Uh, 10,000. So as you can see as we look through this, mine tend to be considerably less from an average perspective. I mean, even the vehicular. But they are indemnified only, and so theirs would be higher. They're not being dragged down by the inexpensive medical claims. So, not to be a hypocrite. Put this over here. Copy. Paste. I'm gonna turn that into a filter. We're going to filter by indemnity. Paid indemnity, smallest to lowest. Smallest to lowest, smallest to highest. All right, and I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of everything that doesn't have an indemnity payment. Did I do that right? I think I did. There's not going to be much left, though, because... Wow, okay, there it is. There's the last one. And that's a weird one. It's a vehicular. Oh, well, it's indemnified. Let's hit uh, cut. Oh, I didn't, I didn't use the uh, macros that time. Look at me getting all old. All right. I really hate that I don't have the drag bar here. All right, let's see what happened. Because obviously it updated. I don't have a lot left. Let's see what we've got. Oh, the numbers have changed significantly. So my average claim here is $34,000 compared to the states, which is eight. My average is 54,000 compared to the states, which is 12, 25 to 10, 57 to nine, 8,000 to 7,000. 25 to 20, six, oh, there's nothing there. And the average indemnity calculated is 10,000 minus 35. So that's if it's just indemnified. Um, if it's medical only, you know, that counts less towards the EMR and stuff like that. I still think it's important to calculate those, especially when you have a low number of indemnified claims. Because companies, if they have an aggressive, um, and that's a bad word, active, return to work policy will have a lot fewer indemnified claims, meaning <coughs> they're not paying the worker lost wages. And that's what indemnity primarily is, is paying the worker lost wages, in addition to medical bills and all that other stuff. Yeah. So wasn't that interesting, ladies and gentlemen? I think it was. So indemnified claims are definitely more expensive Um is it bad that we're higher? No, it's just a comparison. This is just a point of interest. And what I do is I would share both in my report, if 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 you're interested, and say this is with medical claim. This is all medical, just zero dollar claims removed. That was the first one we looked at. We're lower. This one, uh, only claims that had indemnified payments in it were compared, and that's what we came up with. Okay. Just a point of interest. The other thing I'd like you guys to look at. And we can't do much with it. I apologize. 
you know, you work with what you get, right? Usually I get multiple years of mod rates, multiple years of premium paid, and then we can kind of compare it to the data. We've got two things working against us. One, we've got 2022 EMR, which means what could, what, you know, what do they use to calculate it? Uh, they use the 2018, 2019, and 2020 numbers. We don't have any of 2018 and only half of 2019. So we only have, actually have half the data. And it's a three-year running average. So it enclosed those three years. So next year's, the 2018 data just completely drops away. And then the 2021 data is, is added on. Um, because we don't know what the 2020, it's because we don't know what the 2018 data is. We don't know if it's higher or lower than the 2021. So you need at least five years, if not more. You know, six, seven, maybe eight years is 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 adequate because then you can really trend things. Um, but in this case, you know, you get what you get, and you try to make the best of it without um, putting too much presumption into your responses. Okay, and that's something you guys will make mistakes on, and I'll try and correct you and help you out. That's just the point of it. Um, so a couple of things I did here. So I put up this, you know, policy year, EMR, we know only one year and what year's data went into it. Um, basically, and, I, and this isn't this isn't a direct one-to-one, -one, just in general, the 122, the 1.22 EMR means that the rolling average of claim data was about 22% higher than what was expected. So that, this is the uh, formula. I got this from the WCRB. Uh, I'll be there in just a second. Experience modification formula. Actual primary losses divided by expected losses. But there's other stuff in here. Okay, It'll end up being total A divided by total B. I don't know why. And I don't know if this, I don't, this, this minus one minus weighted value times expected excess. And this is also, I just, I wonder if that's a typo. Why you would put that above that? Because adding it on, does it? what does it do to the equation? It's like, oh, let's add one, let's add one. It doesn't do much to the equation. I don't know. And the same with the ballast value. That's what it is. Uh, earlier on, I had told you, and Jim Jones talked about this in his video, that there's usually about a 60% risk ratio. That's approximate uh, for most cases. That's the aim, which means for whatever... The company pays annually for the base premium. Uh, they're expecting around sixty percent of that. Um, they're expecting about sixty percent of that to be paid out, um, which is, that would make it kind of even. But there's usually still a little bit more wiggle room there. So there's about a forty percent overhead. That's what they're hoping to get. And they're hoping to get more, you know, and over time, they'll actually reward a company who consistently gets below that mark. Um, so I think we get that somewhere in the, like the, these values here, they build in that 40% overhead for certain industries. They'll go a little bit leaner on that, you know, and maybe only accept 20, 15%, depending on the size of the premiums that they can collect. Sometimes they ask for more because there's a greater range of loss, greater risk of massive loss, excess loss. So, um, yeah, that's the basic rundown. So what I put down here, so the base premium is equal to the adjusted premium. Uh, oh, wait. Okay, so the adjusted premium is equal to the base times by the EMR. Here I have the base is equal to the adjusted divided by the EMR, which is how I took, which is what I, I took uh, the 2.9 million divided by 1.22. So this is the base premium. This is what... WCRB would calculate as um, for the company based on their payroll and the class codes that they submit associated with those payroll numbers. This is the amount that comes up. And with a 60% return or uh, risk ratio, they would expect the company to have somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, 1.4 million in claims. That's what that means. Seems excessively high to me. Another thing Jim t talks about is typically, you know, rule of thumb. He said he can usually take like a base premium, divide it by 2,000 and estimate the number of workers. Or take the number of workers times 2,000 and estimate what the base premium would be. And then you multiply it by the EMR and then you get their adjusted premium. That's what they get charged per year. So again, 
adjusted premium is kind of like the net. You know, that's what you're charged. So if your EMR is below one, you're paying a discounted amount. If your EMR is higher than one, you're paying a prorated or a higher amount. Is that the right term? I can't remember. Okay, so the other thing we can do, but that's all we can do. We can't really compare it to our data. I apologize. That's the best we can do. I just want you guys to try and draw some connection between, you know, we've got these claims that come out of this policy, the company pays for the policy, and then there's this crazy equation <coughs> that's used. Um, there's these other crazy things that go into it. It's pretty complex, everybody. The last thing I want you to do before we do like a general walkthrough of this project is to go to the WCRB and look up the class codes and, and write down what the rates are because it's interesting whether the rates increase or decrease over time because these are all affected by overall claims, industry claims. They will increase them or decrease them based on the trend. They don't usually change much and when they do, there must be something significant. You know, it could be that it would go down significantly if pay went up because they're trying to even it out because payroll contributes. So if pay was increased by 10% across the board, this would have to come down by 10%. So it'd be so employers aren't, you know, paying 10% more for workers and 10% more for work comp. Um, if it's going down, okay, that may be somewhat of a recession thing too. Oh, wait, it goes the other way. So it's going this way, sorry. So I've got the 2022. So this has actually gone down substantially. That's come down, that's come down, that's come down, that's come down. And okay, all numbers have come down. It could mean that in general, the overall, the industry is finding that there aren't as many claims as expected. And so there's an industry adjustment. That's probably what it means. All right, so you're like, how do I find those? Because I'm looking up too. Open up a web browser. I think it's wcrb.org. It's a guess. We've looked at this before, right? If you want information, like I just found on the uh, the EMR, you can look under manuals. It's got an EMR manual. That's where I took it from. It's right there. I copied the thing out of there. The, copied the equation of the thing. My brain's really going. All right, let's look up class code. So class code lookup is right here. Just type in the number. So from our report, first one, 9040, I'm just gonna copy it. Can't remember it, not with my brain. Paste, search, here we go. So we've got their rates going all the way back to 2003. I just did it from like 2019, yeah. You can see it went down, it's got other information about it. But all it is, this is the rate the company pays per $100 payroll annually for the workers who have the class code 904, which is hospital, all other professional employees. That's all it is. You can search and find more. Now, I did find in our data set, because we are multi-state, that some of these numbers don't come up in Wisconsin. You can Google these and find them. Um, I didn't find actual rates for them because it was just I was just trying to see if it was interesting or not. <clears throat> just something to do. Yeah, it's what we. It's about all we can. All right. So, what did we do here? So, we were asked to analyze a data set. You should always get to know the data itself. Um, is there anything kind of screwy about it? You know, the dates, the number, the totals, subtotal. This is something you should always do, just to understand um, what's there before you get your hands dirty. Um, I love the line by Dave Chappelle. He's my favorite comedian, by the way. Dave Chappelle said, "You should know what's in the hot dogs you eat." And I, I kind of think that feel that's what this feels like. Before you start chewing away at this data, you should know what's there, what's in there. And I think this provides a decent representation of what we're about to get ourselves into. The next step is, well, if we look at it all, let's look at all the data, you know, plotted from how much it's paid to how, you know, uh, how much it's paid. That's basically, that's what our x-axis is. Up and down is the count. So how many claims fall on this range here? And what it shows us is we, we should have a nice normal curve that there are just a few that are inexpensive, there's just a few that are expensive, but majority of them kind of fall in some sort of middle area. We do not have that, which basically then tells us uh, we've got a biased data set or a skewed data set. That means kind of the same thing. We've got a bunch of outliers up here. 
and there's probably some here as well, and that we need to be careful when we report something like average because average and median are nowhere near each other. And why is that? Well, the average goes up because of the high claims. The median goes down because of the $0 claims. The thing is, I don't like to delete data. I don't like to, cons I don't like to remove data from the, cons from the conditions because um, we need everything we can get. But we also have to consider how they contribute to statistics. So that's what that tells us. So is it a good or bad data set? This doesn't say it. We just report that this is what the data is. What's the quality? Well, here it is. These are the answers. I'm not trying to tell management one way or the other, though. At the end, I would love it if you came up with some ideas on additional data that could be collected with these analyses, with this claim stuff, um, to give us a better picture. And that's that's the purpose of this. Every time it gets a little bit better because you 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 know you collect something a little bit differently, or you add a variable, you take one out, so you get a better understanding of what's going on. So the the actual data you collect, the way you collect it, the way you analyze it, that also improves over time. <coughs> that's basically the way an accreditation process works too. Are you improving based on what you're collecting? And is the collection system continually evaluated and improved? And indeed, we identified outliers based on sort of a visual. Um, you know, on this last one, it showed there's a bunch of weird little bumps in between here. You want it to be a little bit smoother, and that's what this gives us. A little bit more of a smoother decline. Okay. And we get to see how much we took out. It's a nice comparison. It's cool. Let's see. And then we had to answer the question, how's the safety program performing? There's three ways to look at it. One is, are the number of claims going up? They are. Um, but is that reflected in more benefits being paid out? It's, it's not overall, although medical seems to have been about even at this point. Um, the indemnity has been going down. Maybe that's because they have an aggressive, or not aggressive, an active return to work program. Likely it is. And then down here are the you know, NAE or LAE stuff, legal stuff. So it's kind of interesting to me. Now, uh, we also know that there are some, uh, there are 7.7% open claims still in uh, 2021. So this number is likely to come up a little bit. This number will likely come up a little bit, but I don't think so much that it's ever going to make itself even. I think they have a decline at the time. So they're doing something right. We need to understand what that is and then find the things where we can maybe either apply it to other areas or maybe there are additional improvements that can be made. I hope that makes sense. So this is the raw data. This is what the outliers removed. <coughs> Why? Am I way up here? Always try to save your work on the tabs so it brings you directly to what the results are. And I'm going to do this, and I'm going to save my work. So the next time I open this, there we go. So the R values improved a little bit. Same basic uh, answer that uh, because there are less benefits being paid out each fiscal year, it appears that something is going right. But I bet we can still find some opportunities to focus for improvement. I. I don't even know if there is yet or not. I may be eating my hat later, but uh, I think we probably will because don't we always? Then we tried to figure out what our um, where we're going to focus from a class code perspective. One and two, you know, nine zero four zero and eight eight three three came out even when we did the outlier removal, which I thought we would because it was such a strong for location. We ended up at about a top seven, not real happy with having a top seven because we only had 60% of the claims. And when we did the outliers, it changed up a little bit. Uh, one, two, four, one, two, three, and four. I don't know. It, it, when it changes that much with outliers in or out, not happy. Though number one may have value. I may be able to look at that one. And I may go as far as looking at the top three. Though we don't have the Pareto, the Pareto, again, is just meant to give us sort of a justified cutoff point. For the jurisdiction, we have the top four. What happened when we removed the outliers? It The top four. So jurisdiction, that's an interesting one for me. 
Um, I may stick with that because when you when the top four remains the top four after the outliers are removed, that um, I think that's grounds for something. You know, it's grounds to this may be something I look at. So I'll probably maybe skip the location one and I'll do a class code analysis and a jurisdiction. I'll do them both and then I'll let you know which one we're gonna go with. Okay. I mean, if this was just yours, you do them, you do all three and then tell me, but I'm not gonna make you do that. I'll do it. If you want to do it, you can. Oh, I was trying to make it uh, bigger and I kept moving it over there. Now we're looking at claimed at overall for cause, and this is the parent cause. I mean, it, it'd be nice if we could reclassify these, but I don't think we need to. It's an extra step, save you guys time. It was easy to pick out the top four, the magnitude of the RPN guided that. Plugged it in, one, two, and three. So I would go with the top three. One, two, and three is gonna be good, even though five comes up here it just when you when you you know switch it around and uh the top three remains the top three you go with that and that i believe we did the detail cause there's just too much here when there's too much data it's uh it would take you too long to try and figure out where to focus and um you know you got to move on <laughs> You only have so much time and you know that's the way it is so the next step and then you know start doing this stuff because it's kind of fun to look at it so this is the this is what the uh, medical claims in this is what the medical claims out and I'll add some comments and stuff here so now we're gonna try to narrow down our focus to um, you know a class code or a jurisdiction and then within those, we're going to look at the um, the causes that, you know, we're because this will self-populate. Because what we're going to be doing now is picking out what we want to and then removing the claims. This is the part we delete. We remove the claims that don't have the qualifications we're interested in studying. And then we forecast it. We may, we may have limited data in some places. We may not be able to do an actual visual forecast like we did uh, back here. We, might not, be, we not, might not have enough data when we narrow down to a particular you know, class code and cause or uh, jurisdiction or cause. We may not. And we can go annual averages there and kind of just look at it that way. But I think we'll try to find a few cases in which it appears that the claims and the costs are going up in certain, you know, dual priorities. I'll call it dual priorities. I kind of like the sound of that. All right. I hope this was helpful. Um, as far as what I want for this week, I mean, if I just go to the detail, you know, we have all these tables. They make them all look pretty. Make sure you've got the Pareto analysis. Point to where your cutoff is. Explain why. So you're going to have one with the outliers removed, and you're going to have one with the outliers in it that's really it and then really start putting together what your plan is for this report um, ultimately we're going to get to that point we're going to find out you know what we're recommending you know we may have two of these tables one will be policy class one will be class code cause one will be jurisdiction cause and uh yeah we'll see if there's some intersection there between them and we're not giving any answers we're not saying hey Slip trips and falls. Let's go put down mats. No, what we're saying is we see that there is a an apparent in, there's going to be a, there's an anticipated increase in these types of claims in the future. It's going to approximately cost the company or the company's policy is going to pay out about this much. We would like to request uh, based on a twenty five percent return on investment this amount of money to go study it and see if we can't figure out what can actually be done to mitigate. What's allowing these to occur continually over time? That's all I got, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully I feel better from COVID the next time I see you. But hopefully you guys are all staying healthy. Take care.